Well, hey, good morning, church. Thanks for being here. My name is Clayton. I am the student pastor and family director here at the church, and I'm excited to continue in our series of A Better Savior this morning. Hey, before we get going, uh, just as a reminder, Justin will be joining us, I'm sure, virtually. Uh, He is on a sabbatical right now, and to be clear, this is not a disciplinary sabbatical in any way, shape, or form. Uh, The elders are kind enough to to implement a sabbatical policy. I had one back in May, our operation director had one uh, a couple months ago, and then Justin gets his turn right now, and so he is resting in the Lord by himself and with his family, and so uh, continuing to pray for him that he uh, does continue to rest well. And before Justin went on sabbatical, we uh, had a, a conversation about this series a better savior. And so as we were kind of lining out what the weeks were going to be, we came across this week, a better sacrifice. And the only text that I could think of that fit this really, really well in the Old Testament was Genesis 22. And so I went to him and I said, Justin, I, uh, I think this fits, but here, here's my big problem. I don't understand lots of things in the Bible. Uh, and Genesis 22 in particular is one of those things at the top of the list. Uh, I don't get it. I don't like it. If I'm going to be honest, and uh, I think I should do a different passage. And he goes, let me challenge you. Maybe this is your opportunity to dive in deep. And, I, and I'm like, no, absolutely not. I'm going to pick a different passage. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. <laughs> and we are going to dive in to God's word. We'll be in 1 through 14. So pray with me. Jesus, thank you for this time. Lord, stir our affections for you. As we dive into a a complex narrative, Jesus, I pray that you would draw us to yourself. Lord, that we would walk away from this text far more worshipful in understanding who you are as God and in your character. So Lord, I pray that you would think with my mind and my words would be your words. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for God? For God. Every anniversary, my wife and I, Katie, what we do is we write an anniversary letter to each other. And so what we do is we recap the the previous year. And what this typically entails is uh, certain events that happened over the course of the year. We tell each other of the ways that we've specifically have, we've seen each other grow in the previous year of our marriage. And then most notably, what we take account of is God's faithfulness in our life and in our marriage throughout that year. Okay, because if you are like me, you can suffer from severe memory loss of God's faithfulness in your life. Okay, maybe you can relate to that. So we write about things like when finances are tight, but the Lord went ahead and provided because is anything too hard for God? Uh, we had years of infertility to now have three children. Is anything too hard for God? Now, maybe for you, you, could, you would be able to write about uh, how he can kill your favorite sin or uh, open a womb for infertility and deliver you from addiction because, let's be honest, is anything too hard for God? And, you know, even in really difficult times, God is so good that he will give us not what we want but exactly what we need. So, for example... Uh, I have had, personally, I have had physical ailments my whole life. Most notably, I was uh, born blind in my left eye. I still have a birth defect. I have had 12 surgeries in total just on my left eye to try to create sight and to absolute no avail. And I cannot tell you how many times I have prayed for healing to come for it to never actually come. And over the years, I began to realize that the physical healing, personally for me, is not my gift because the greater gift is knowing that the Lord's grace is sufficient for today is anything too hard for God. So this morning, in Genesis 22, Abraham is going to live out this question, is anything too hard for God? And it is a perplexing narrative that we're going to read, and we're going to see Abraham go through a very difficult test. We're going to see him have immovable trust in God, and ultimately what this text points to is a better sacrifice, and his name is Jesus at the end. So that's where we're going this morning, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 4. Scripture reads, After these things God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. 
He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. So the scripture starts with, after these things. We have to have a discussion in terms of context on what's after these things. See, Abraham used to be called Abram before his name was changed to Abraham. And he was Abram when he was called by God. And when he was called by God, he was an idol worshiper. That, that is what he did. He did not worship uh, the God of the Bible. He was worshiping other false gods. In Genesis 12, God asks Abram, I need you to pick up everything that you have. And, and it, in the text it says, go to the land that I will show you. Which if you're reading and you're Abraham, you're thinking north, south, east, west, help a brother out. Where are we going? God says, you go to the land that I will show you. So Abram, who was, who was wildly wealthy, picks up his businesses. He has hundreds of employees, picks up his family, and he moves hundreds of miles on foot to go to the land that God told him to go to. Abraham faith, and he picked up and he moved everything. And in that process of Genesis 12, God told Abram that he is going to have, through his offspring, is going to come a great nation through whom the whole world will be blessed. But there's a problem, because what you also need to know is that his wife, Sarah, could not have kids. Scripture says in other places that her womb was dead. That presents a problem. So what God does is God makes a promise to Abram that he is going to fulfill this promise. That, it, that, that yes, you will have that offspring even though you cannot have kids. The promise is going to come. And to make sure that Abram believes God, he enters into a covenant with then now Abraham. See, this is more than a promise. What a covenant is, is is simply an agreement between two parties. But what God is doing in this particular covenant is he's putting his whole reputation, his character on the line. He's saying, if this does not come to pass, uh, well, it will not. It, it will come to pass, and I'm putting my character, my whole reputation, on the line. And then eventually, if you fast forward to chapter 21, you see in the beginning of chapter 21, Abraham and Isaac, or excuse me, Abraham and Sarah have their child Isaac. In a complete, total miracle of God, they have a child long after either one of them were supposed to be having a child. See, God kept His promise. God kept his promise. And in chapter 21, if you read that chapter, decades go by from his birth, and decades are, are passing in chapter 21. Abraham and Isaac's lives, they're relatively uneventful. They're building, they're planting, they're establishing themselves. And from the promise given to the promise fulfilled, it was 25 years that Abraham and Sarah waited for Isaac See, the greater the struggle, the sweeter the victory. And oh, what a sweet victory was this baby boy. They were so excited. And it was through this patience that Abraham realized that nothing was too hard for God. And it was after these things, as the text says, God tested Abraham. God tests Abraham. And I want to be clear that God isn't punishing Abraham and that God isn't tempting Abraham. God is testing Abraham. Abraham. And this test is not for God because God knows exactly what's getting ready to happen. This test is exactly for Abraham. So that begs the question, what does testing from God look like? How would God, what does it mean for God to test us? Well, I believe it does two things. It reveals and it refines. It reveals and refines you for the purpose of knowing God and becoming more like him. See, to refine is to reestablish and solidify any sort of convictions to see if the foundation is really shaky or not. To make sure that it is stable. Because imagine who you'd be if you were always the same. Just year after year, decade after decade, uh, after decade just never changing, always the same. See, if you want to get stronger in the gym, you actually have to test your strength. If you, want to, if you want to have stronger character, your character has to be tested. See, your life would be a whole lot easier without refinement. But would it be fruitful? 
Maybe, maybe the struggle is a gift and not a curse. See, only fire can refine gold to burn away the impurities, as is in your life. Only trials can refine you and burn away the impurities. That's part of what testing does. Testing also, what it does is it reveals. Testing reveals something about yourself, and sometimes it shows you sins that you didn't even know that were in there. Or what it also does is it shows you God's character to replace those sins. Let me give you an example. So when your kids start acting a fool, and you see how impatient you are towards your kids, it reveals how patient God has been toward you. Ooh, I just messed with some family with toddlers up in here, up in here. See, maybe that thing you can't stand about your spouse actually reveals what you idolize and they're attacking your idol. See, now I just put my dirty boots all up on your couch, okay? And it is in the nature and character of God to provide for you after this test, but I'm getting ahead of myself. What was Abraham's test? It's a strange one, to offer his one and only son whom he loves as a burnt offering to the Lord. And that, in a burnt offering in the Old Testament, what it would be is it is a total consumption of the animal as a substitutionary atonement for their sins. So uh, God was uh, so kind and so gracious that instead of exacting appropriate justice on sinners for their sin, what God did, he was gracious enough to offer a temporary sacrifice or a substitute for their sin. This is a burnt offering. Abraham See, he's heard the phrase, go to the land that I will show you before. This time, it's go to the mountain that I will show you and worship. See, in Genesis 12, God asked Abraham, you need to pick up everything and go. And in Genesis 22, he was told to pick up his everything and go. See, Isaac is special. He is the promised child through whom all of the nations will be blessed, and from him will come a nation. And it is because of that promise, now this is the key, it's because of this promise we're going to see that God does not want Isaac's life. What he really wants is Abraham's heart. That's what he wants. So Abraham, what he does is he gets up in the morning and he obeys immediately. Now, this journey, it took three days, and it was about 45 miles long. And as I'm uh, reading and studying this, I'm thinking there was plenty of time for him to think, mm, maybe that was a wrong voice. Maybe I had some indigestion, so to speak, and I wasn't feeling so good. Did I hear a wrong voice? But Abraham never turns back. He never turns around, and he doesn't do any of that. So I had to ask myself a question, what does Abraham know that I don't? So I had to diagnose myself uh, because I know more than Abraham, right? Abraham didn't have a Bible. I have the whole thing, right? So what does he know that I don't? And I've concluded that it wasn't what Abraham knew. It was how deep he believed because I know more than Abraham and I have far less faith than Abraham because let's be real, I only have one son. And if someone comes and asks me to harm my son or then they do it, church, I'm going to be clear. I'm going to do prison ministry from the inside, okay? It just is what it is. See, faith in God is not separated from obedience, can't have one without the other. And we've defined faith here as what you trust, treasure, and surrender. And what I want you to see here is that Abraham trusts the character of God. And he, and he treasures the promises and the covenant that God made with him. And as a result, he surrenders to God's will. Because God, he doesn't sacrifice children. That's what the demonic does. So, how does God's character and this request make any sense at all? How, do, how, how, does, how does this make sense? Well, a lot of us, including myself, struggle with this passage because we like to make God into our own image. Uh, we often won't let God be God who is just and holy and also good, and he is not in our control, and we love control. We like to think that God would make the exact same choices that I would make, and we like to test God rather than have God test us. We like to put him on trial rather than have him test us. And this isn't uncommon. Uh, let me give you an example. There's a, a very well-known story of Steve Jobs. When he was 13 years old, he walks into his pastor's office and says, Hey, can God really do anything? 
And the pastor, not knowing that he was being set up by Steve Jobs, the pastor says, yes, God can do anything. So he takes out a Time Magazine article, slams it on the pastor's desk. Then on the cover of that Time Magazine article was a picture of starving children. And he says, if, if God can fix anything, why won't he fix this? See, I don't know what the answer was that Steve Jobs got, but nonetheless, Steve Jobs didn't like the answer. And he never went back to church ever again in his whole life because according to Steve Jobs, God failed his audition. See, God is the one that failed Steve Jobs' test. But this test, in our text, isn't filling in a gap of our understanding of God. It's filling in a gap of our understanding of Abraham's faith. See, instead of unraveling this contradiction, what Abraham does, what he decides to do is to wait on God for him to prove his character. And what we fear most is often where we trust God the least, but there is no fear that I can see according to the text. Maybe there is some if you read between the line, but through Abraham's actions, you don't see a lot of fear because even with this difficult test, what we see from Abraham to God is an immovable trust in God. Read with me in 5 through 9 as we read about Abraham's immovable trust. Verse 5, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back to you again. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they, were both, they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I. It's the second time. My son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Verse 9, and when they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in, in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. So here's Abraham and Isaac. They're with two other men. And they're at the base of the mountain. And then Abraham tells these two other men, hey, you stay here. My son and I, we're going to go up this mountain in worship. And I want you to hear what the text says. We will both be back. We're going to go up and worship. Both of us are going to come back down the mountain. But Abraham knows exactly what a burnt offering is. It is a total consumption of the animal. And that's what God has asked him to do. How could this be? See, Abraham loves his son, his one and only son, and this is a good gift. Isaac is a good gift, and if you're like me, it's really easy to take good gifts from God and actually make them God. See, Isaac is special. He is the promised child through whom will come a nation and the whole world will be blessed. See, previously Abraham worshipped idols when God saved him. So it wouldn't be too far out of character for Abraham to begin to worship idols again. And it wouldn't be out of character for Abraham to make Isaac the son that he loved, the son that he worshipped. So God put Abraham in a position to choose. And he did. He knows what God has instructed him to do. And yet, he says... We're both coming back. How? Hebrews 11 gives us incredible insight on what Abraham is thinking. Hebrews 11 says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered. Other translations would say that he reasoned, that the only logical conclusion that Abraham could come up with, with was that God was able even to raise him from the dead from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. See, Abraham had enough trust in God that he knew God was going to resurrect his son Isaac some way, somehow. We see this confidence in verse 5 in chapter 22 where he says, I and the boy, we're coming back. We're coming back. Now, where in the world would Abraham get this idea from? Because ain't no one else resurrected from the dead previously uh, in, in, in Genesis at all. 
Now, I know nothing is too hard for God, but Easter is not on the radar for Abraham with his pastel robes getting ready to go to church to celebrate an empty tomb. Like, there is no death-stealing, grave-robbing Savior that Abraham can base his resurrected faith off of. So where does he get this? Well, to give you a little bit of a teaser coming in uh, the new year when we jump back into Romans, Romans 4 gives us some insight. It says this, In hope he, meaning Abraham, believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. And he did not weaken in faith. Listen, when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Where in the world did Abraham see resurrection before? In his own body and in his wife's. Sarah's womb was resurrected. Abraham saw God take something dead and bring to life to create life. And from then on, Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to do exactly what he had promised him to do. See, he believed that nothing was too hard for God. He had to go back and remember some things that God did it before. Surely God will do it again. Church, I wonder if sometimes we have a memory problem. I know you grew up in a tough family, but God showed up and saved you and broke that generational curse. You were the one to break the generational curse. I wonder if sometimes, church, we have a memory problem. I know in your suffering it feels like you can't take another step, and yet here you are this morning with breath in your lungs, singing out to God and being loved by God. I wonder if sometimes we have a memory problem. I know you feel isolated in your sin and in your situation only for God to be so good to bring someone into your life who's been there, done that, and they believe God even deeper and love him more. Church, I wonder if sometimes we have a memory problem. See, Abraham is convinced that God can bring the dead to life because he's seen it before. And it is this confidence in who God is and what God will do that we see a strangely calm interaction between Abraham and Isaac. See, in verse 8, Abraham tells Isaac that the Lord is going to provide. So Isaac doesn't really know what's going on. They've had three days to have this this discussion, and it hasn't been talked about. But then in verse 9, we see that Isaac is bound up on the altar. So at some point, there was a conversation that was had between 8 and 9 that we don't necessarily know about. But this is what I want you to see. I want you to see a willingness from Isaac to surrender to his father. He's not a little kid being manipulated by dad. Okay? Because at this point... Abraham is well over 100, okay? Isaac, at this point, he's in his 30s. Now, if I had to guess, if Isaac really wanted to rebel against his dad, verbally or physically, I have a sneaky suspicion he could manage, right? Because if you're over 100, let's be real, a stiff breeze could take you out, let alone a young man in his 30s, okay? Okay? In no way. So as I read this, I had to ask myself the question, how did Abraham gain that type of trust with his kid? Well, this is what I believe. In chapter 21, that's where they spent decades together, building, creating, cultivating. And between father and son, a deep bond was formed. See, as a parent... Sometimes our personal test is not just for us, it's for our kids to watch us. For us to be honest with them about where we struggle, but have enough faith in Jesus to keep going. Uh, I want to tell my kids when I'm anxious and nervous, and my kids need to know that when I'm scared, but I went ahead and, do, I went ahead and did what I'm supposed to do anyway because that's being courageous, right? Right? I want, them, I want to continue to point them back to the gospel by forgiving them and also by asking for forgiveness from them, to, to give grace and to pursue justice because, church, there is a world of difference between raising your kids in church and discipling your kids in Jesus. 
Huge difference. Because taking them to a place to hear about Jesus is good and it is needed, and that's part of the discipleship process. But what will transform them is for you to be like Jesus. That's what changes the trajectory of their whole life. And I believe, ultimately, this is what Abraham did for Isaac for 30 years. For 30 years. See, Abraham told him about all the ways that he failed. I mean, Abraham, dude was a scoundrel. He sold his wife twice. That ain't right. Just so you know, that ain't it, okay? He went through this whole host of sins on how he sinned against his wife and how he sinned against God. And he also told him about the ways that Abraham took massive, massive steps of faith to honor God and to please God. And all of that over time culminates into an immovable trust in God where it God took a dead womb and brought it to life to create Isaac's life. So Isaac, after that bond is formed over 30 years, what Isaac does is he lays down as a willing sacrifice for his father. And ultimately what we will see is that God does not want Isaac's life. What he really wants is Abraham's heart. Because there will be something that will die in Isaac's place for their sins. And we will see in verses 10 through 14 that the Lord is going to provide a temporary substitute. A temporary substitute. Verse 10. Then Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. That's the third time. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I now know, here's the reason, for I now know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So Abraham, we see him here. He raises a knife. And then the angel of the Lord steps in to stop him. Uh, Now, what did that voice sound like? And I have no idea, but I'm going to have to assume it was pretty authoritative. That's probably what it sounded like. And what you also need to know is that in the Old Testament, when it says an angel of the Lord, it's an angel. It's a messenger from God. It's an angel of the Lord. But when it says the angel of the Lord, and I love this, this is pre-incarnate Jesus. Like Jesus is literally showing up to Abraham to tell him to stop. And Jesus can do that because Jesus always was, always has been, and he always will be. So Jesus literally shows up to stop Abraham. And I want you to notice what Jesus says to Abraham or what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, yo, stop. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Bro, I was just joking. Gosh, you took it so seriously. What a, that's not what he said. What was the reason that he told him to stop? Jesus points to the fact that he feared God, that he believed God. Because the intent was to never take Isaac's life. It was to capture Abraham's heart for the Lord. Because remember, this is a test. And after the test, the Lord provides a substitute sacrifice. See, there was a ram behind him caught in a thicket. Now, I have no idea if the ram was there the whole time, but what I do know is the ram was not revealed until Abraham took that step of faith. Do you see it? See, Abraham was climbing the mountain in faith with his troubles, and the solution was walking up the other side of the mountain. Friends, what Abraham did not do was give up on the mountainside. Church, don't give up on the mountainside. I know it's hard to see God in the ruins of your situation, but one day your mess will become a ministry. Don't give up on the mountainside. One day you'll be able to testify about all of the battles that you've actually won and how when you had nothing left to give, you found that God was your strength and your portion. Church, do not give up on the mountainside. See, Abraham had enough faith to take him up the mountain, and that's exactly where the Lord provided is when he got up to the mountain. And he took the provisional ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son because Isaac was never the one meant to be sacrificed. There was always meant to be something else die in his place for their sins. God provided a way. 
See, years later in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, on that exact same mountain, God would institute the temple. See, and on that temple is where God would establish a, uh, a temporary sacrificial system. So instead of exacting the justice, uh, the due justice on sinners for their sin, there was a temporary substitute in their place for their sin. But each substitute was incomplete because the animal was incomplete. What God's people needed was a better sacrifice. Now, I want to be super clear about something because I had to wrestle with this and ask myself this question as well. Would God ask you to do the same thing that he's asking Abraham to do? Absolutely not. Okay? God is not asking you and will never ask you to do this ever. There's lots of reasons, but let me give you two reasons. See, when you read your Bible, you have to understand whether it is prescriptive or descriptive, meaning this. Is it prescribing something that you should be doing or is it describing something that happened? Which do you think this is? I know you're frustrated at your kids, but listen, it's describing, okay? It's describing something that happened, okay? It's describing. Okay, now that we have that, also, the second reason is this is a very specific situation for a very specific thing pointing to a very specific thing, right? Right? This situation was a one-time thing for Abraham for a specific purpose because of what it points to, and this whole situation is a pointer to a better sacrifice. So listen, God isn't going to ask you to do, so if someone comes and asks you, would God, no, he won't because they have a misunderstanding of, this, of the scriptures. Because the better sacrifice, he already came. He went to a, he went to a mount called Calvary, and he, and he was the better sacrifice, and he died in your place for your sins. There is no reason for God to ever do this for any of us, uh, ask us to do this, because it's already been done in Jesus, okay? To be super clear. And the amount of parallels that I'm getting ready to read between Isaac and Jesus is a pointer to the better sacrifice that we have in Jesus, let me read some for you. See, Isaac was born according to the promise to start the nation of Israel through whom the whole world will be blessed. Jesus was the promised one who would save Israel and the world. See, Isaac was deeply loved by his father and obeyed his father willingly, even to the point of death on the altar. Jesus was deeply loved by his father and willingly obeyed him, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, Isaac was escorted to a place of sacrifice by two men. Jesus hung on the cross in between two thieves. Isaac carried the wood on his back to the place of sacrifice. Jesus carried the wooden cross on his, black, on his back to the place where he would sacrifice himself. See, Isaac was told that a lamb would be provided for the sacrifice. Years later, Jesus, the lamb of God, provided himself as the sacrifice. See, Isaac was brought back from the dead figuratively. Jesus was brought back from the dead literally. And we could keep going. There was a three-day journey. Jesus went on a three-day journey. I mean, we could keep going. See, the hope that Abraham had for his son is fulfilled in God's son. And Jesus died in our place for our sins as the better sacrifice by rising from the grave so we can actually have life. And this is one of the many, 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 many proofs that there's nothing too hard for God. So let me end on a question. What in your life just seems impossible? The infertility, the wayward kid, the, the sin that keeps plaguing you, the, I mean, the list goes on and on. What just seems impossible? Now my question is what is God calling you to do to exercise faith like Abraham did. Maybe you're in a season of testing to reveal and to refine. And the struggle is not a curse, but it's a gift. Maybe. What are you praying for this morning? For God to do what only God can do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being the better sacrifice. Lord, whether the healing comes or it doesn't, you are the greater gift. Lord, whether you move 
or you don't, Jesus, I pray that all of this would point to a better rejoicing and that you are the better sacrifice. Father God, I pray for, um, as some of us are going through it, a difficult test, Lord, that you would, through your character, through your word, through, through who you are, you would give us an immovable trust. Lord, that we would remember your sacrifice. Lord, help us marvel in that and worship in that. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.